Hi friends, uh, today my topic is how mental health can affect the stomach and gastrointestinal issues that we deal with as well as how GI tract can also affect mental health or, or the mind. And really what I wanted to give you a sense is that the digestive system is very integrated with the central nervous system or the brain. I wanted to share some uh, mechanisms. There is constant communication going on from the brain and tissues to the gut related tissues and these connections are can be divided into three or four uh, uh, different ones one is a connection of basically the nerves which is the vagus nerve and other nerves second one is the immunological mechanism meaning the body's immune system a third one is endocrine which is hormonal pathway and the fourth one uh, is just bacteri is bacterial products as well as another system called sympathetic nervous system. All of these control the flow of information or communication between the gut and the brain and it can go both ways. The first connection that I wanted to, uh, to talk about is the vagal connection. The vagus is a nerve that exits the brain and goes and supplies the entire organs in the belly area. A great majority of the inf information from the gut goes up to the brain through the vagus nerve. So in other words, both if this gut is inflamed, if there is hunger, if there's fullness, all of these impulses from the gut enter the brain. The other part of it is that the vagus carries signals from the brain down and helps in secretion of acid. For example, the sight of food sometimes sets off acid production and that's one mechanism that the vagus nerve does. As the slide shows you, the vagus starts at the top of the brain and collects information from different areas of the brain that I have here, the thalamus, the amygdala, the uh, locus, ceruleus, and it supplies the stomach, small bowel, and the large bowel. And if there's inflammation in the gut, those signals are also, as I mentioned, carried up by the vagus nerve. There's been several modalities that have looked at how to influence the vagus nerve or stimulate the vagus nerve for diseases such as uh, or conditions such as depression or PTSD. So in other words, vagal nerve stimulation. There's been a whole host of other therapies such as yoga, or breathing related techniques that are thought to affect the brain, but predominantly using the vagus as a channel. There's been some mechanisms also that bacteria by acting through the vagus nerve influence the brain. One example that I'd come across in the literature is chronic administration of lactobacillus rhamnosus, pro, in, and these are animal studies, promotes exploratory behavior and administration of B. logum normalizes behavior. So therefore, it looks like bacteria tend to use the vagus nerve also as one of the ways that the brain and the gut talk to each other. The second field is the gut bacteria itself. And there are a number of facts here that are uh, very interesting. We have more than 100 trillion bacterial cells in the human body and it looks like the microbes regulate global nutrient cycles, greenhouse gas exchange, health as well as in disease. And most recently the National Institute of Health Human Microbiome Project as, the, as well as the Meta HIT project funded by the European Union uh, have studied the human microbiota a bit more. We have more genes that encode microbiota in us rather than human genes itself by several fold. The gut bacteria promote digestion, they help in maturation of the digestive tract, they perform some barrier functions by releasing some antimicrobial agents there that help in knocking off or keeping at bay bad bacteria, they help in immune system development, they help in synthesis of essential vitamins like B3, B6, B9, B12. The human gut is essentially sterile when we are born. And as the baby is coming out through the vagina, the uh, vaginal microbiota then influences the gut bacteria followed by uh, the diet as we start eating a diet that is more non-milk based. There are several groups that the human microbiota is, developed in, uh, is divided into. These include Firmicutes, Bacteroides, Actinobacteria, proteobacteria and this bacteroidetes represent 90% of the flora. There's been a great interest in studying this area. There's been at least 250,000 publications in a recent database uh, that deals exclusively with this and of, of them about 15,000 have been related to mental and gut health. 
The second mechanism uh, is also the uh, communication between the gut and the brain through the autonomic nervous system. Developmentally, the gut, gut has a lot of neurons. It's approximately got the same number of neurons that the human spinal cord has. If you look at the intestinal surface area, our skin area, our gut uh, lining is about 10, 100 times more than the surface area of the skin. And what is happening is that when our brain is maturing, a portion of the brain cells migrate down the neural crest and differentiate into the gut. So in other words, embryonically and developmentally, the nervous system, which we traditionally think of in the brain and spinal cord, is also extending down into the, into the gut. So all of these influences are playing uh, together. There's also communication by the body's immune system with the brain. If you look at it, we have two thirds of the body's immune system is in the gut and the intestinal microbiota interacts with the body's immune system and doesn't really activate it. If you really think about it, they're in, in a state of standby. What's happening, I think, is that our body is sensing some of these antigenic exposure that's going on through the gut by a variety of mechanisms and it is recognizing most of that as friendly. Sometimes a change in the microbiome results in alteration of the cytokine profiles and that activates receptors called toll-like receptors. So what's really happening is that between the immune system and the gut bacteria there's a constant dance that's ha happening and sometimes it sets off pro-inflammatory cytokines that travel in the blood and affect the brain. The other part is that the gastrointestinal system is also the largest endocrine organ. Endocrine organs are organs that produce hormones and we normally think about that as thyroid or parathyroid or others but really if you look at the total number of cells there's greater endocrine cells in the body than anywhere else. There's been some data that the gut bacteria also changes based on the neural impulses that come from the brain down into the gut as well. For example, chronic exposure to stress changes the gut microbial uh, community. Some species go down, some species go up. What's happening is that stress changes the way the gut moves, stress changes the way mucin is produced. There's a hormone called noradrenaline that increases uh, and that can also change the gene expression in the bacteria. Typically speaking, the stomach has the least amount of bacteria, followed by the small bowel, followed by the large bowel, and I have a slide here that shows which bacteria are where. Having said that, therefore, if you see these connections, it's not surprising that the intestinal microbiota and the changes in the gut play a role in disease. For example, there's a condition called hepatic encephalopathy that we deal with in GI and liver disease, where in end-stage liver cirrhosis, the brain tends to get foggier. This is thought to be related to certain families of bacteria that correlate with the dysfunction. We have had a recent whole talk on how gut bacteria interface and cause or changes of Parkinson's. In addition, multiple sclerosis is thought to have some origin or connection to the GI tract. Coming to psychiatric disorders, hypothesis has been put forward that late onset autism is associated with changes in gut microbiota. Uh, there may be some differences in gut microbiota and there's been in some interest in Clostridium species here. Sometimes if there's carbohydrate malabsorption, in other words, the ability to uh, that you're not absorbing certain carbohydrates, that stays in the gut, causes more bacteria uh, or influences more bacteria to grow and causes some substrates. There are certain metabolites that the bacteria produce and I have them up here. They're, they're causes of bacterial uh, metabolite and once these metabolites then get into the system they can cause problems. Sometimes they have a digestive role but sometimes they have an adverse role as well. There have been a number of recent trials that are beginning to look at use of probiotics both in mental health uh, as well as certain other conditions and I've listed those uh, and I have some references. Some are recruiting, some are completed so there's a great interest in studying this further because the only ways that you can actually change the gut bacteria are in a positive way is either through changing the food you eat, taking antibiotics, which is not recommended, or instilling some prebiotics uh, and see if that, would, uh, uh, if that is helpful. So these are mechanisms that we think about as we think about this connect complex connection between the gut and the brain and how they play together.